Good morning. I'm Mike Silber. I'm Professor of Neurology at the Mayo Clinic College of Medicine. The paper I'm going to be discussing today is called the Willis Ekbom Disease Foundation Revised Consensus Statement on the Management of Restless Leg Syndrome. This is a consensus statement or an algorithm developed by the Medical Advisory Board of the willis Ekbom Disease Foundation, which used to be called the Restless Leg Syndrome Foundation, but once the name changed to willis Ekbom Disease, the foundation has also changed its name. I have the privilege of chairing the Medical Advisory Board, and I'm therefore the lead author of this paper. This is a revised algorithm. We first published an algorithm as early as 2004, also by the Medical Advisory Board, of which I happen to have been a member back then as well. Um, this algorithm, I'm happy to say, was fairly influential in um, helping clinicians, especially primary care clinicians, in managing restless legs. Now, in the, in the, in the intervening nine years, much has changed in the management of restless legs. New drugs have become available, um, more studies have been done, the disease is better understood in terms of its pathophysiology, and we thought the time had come to update this algorithm as well. The algorithm is consensus-based, but is also based on all the data that is available. We have combined evidence-based um, guidelines with um, extensive clinical experience by the authors of the paper to try and give a practical, helpful approach to the management of restless legs or willis Ekbom disease now in 2013. We've divided willis Ekbom disease into three practical clinical categories. Um, the first of these is intermittent restless legs, the second is chronic um, persistent restless legs, and the third is refractory restless legs based on what we hope are very straightforward um, clinical definitions. The chronic persistent restless legs category, for instance, is defined as restless legs which are frequent and troublesome enough to need daily treatment and occur at least twice a week, causing moderate or severe distress to the patient. This is the category in which most patients present to their physicians. And one of the major changes from the old algorithm is we now suggest that cl clinicians have a choice between prescribing a dopamine agonist or alternatively an alpha-2 delta calcium channel ligand such as gabapentin or pregabalin, etc. This is a distinct change as in the past we said patients in this category should always be given a dopamine agonist. Um, there are various reasons for this including much more extensive use of the dopamine agonists such as pramipexor and ropinirole and we now recognize that these drugs are associated with considerable side effects as time passes including impulse control disorders um, such as pathologic gambling, hypersomnia during the day and the augmentation phenomenon in which the drug seems to change the temporal pattern of the symptoms driving them earlier and earlier in the day. As a result in some patients, it will be more appropriate to start with a calcium channel um, ligand. We provide a table giving the reasons for using one drug rather than the others, and we also have some new tables giving more details of the pharmacokinetics, um, methods of metabolism, etc., as well as the, the dosing of each agent. We then discuss also the refractory group, and one possible change is that we discuss combination therapy as well as explain the importance of high potency opioid therapy in a very selective group of highly refractory patients because studies have now come out showing that in that very selective group um, drugs such as oxycodone and methadone can be used in relatively low dose for long periods with great efficacy and relatively low risk of dependence or other side effects. Um, the other issue that we discuss at length in the paper is the use of iron therapy and the importance of seeing that iron levels are brought up to a really reasonable level in, uh, as a f further adjunctive treatment. Well, we recognize today that chronic persistent willis Ekbom symptoms are present in somewhere between 
1 and 3 percent of the population. There have been some recent excellent studies from Western Europe and the United States showing this fairly constant prevalence figure. Now that doesn't mean that 10 or 20 percent of the population need treatment for restless legs as some old, older studies suggested, but a prevalence of 1 to 3 percent really makes this a common and very disabling disorder. There are studies now showing that patients with restless legs have um, the same interruptions in the quality of their life as patients with any other chronic disease such as rheumatoid arthritis, diabetes, etc. It is an important cause of chronic insomnia and uh, is associated with depression. Therefore, these patients really need help and our hope in this algorithm is that we will provide information which can lead both primary care physicians and more specialist physicians um, to provide optimal, appropriate, and adequate care to these patients. Um, the disease is common. It is still underdiagnosed. It is still, unfortunately, considered by, in, by some people not to be a real disorder, whereas, in fact, it is a very real disorder with a reasonably established pathophysiology and causing considerable suffering to patients. So the take-home message is it's not difficult to diagnose, and we are fortunate in having a number of treatments which work effectively and it's really a question of identifying the patients, selecting the correct approach for each specific patient to relieve their distress. We hope you found this presentation from the content of Mayo Clinic Proceedings valuable. Our journal's mission is to promote the best interests of patients by advancing the knowledge and professionalism of the physician community. If you are interested in more information about us, our home page is www.mayocliniceproceedings.org. There you will find access information for our social media content, such as additional videos on our YouTube channel or journal updates on Facebook. You can also follow us on Twitter. More information about healthcare at Mayo Clinic is available at www.mayoclinic.com. This video content is copyrighted by Mayo Foundation for Medical Education and Research.